I'm honored to be interviewing Otto Niels for the exhibition Creating Community Cinque Gallery Artists that will take place at the Art Students League May 3rd. Welcome Otto Niels. You are a Renaissance man mastering in sculpture, painting, and printmaking. It's good Thank to you have for that. you. Now tell me, what were your first connections with the Cinque Gallery? I think it might have been Ernie Critchlow that uh, first introduced me to Cinque Gallery. And uh, I, I, it's been so long ago, I can't remember exactly what I put in the show or the time period. It must, it had to be, uh, it must have been about 40 years ago or so. And uh, now at this advanced age, <laughs> my memory is not too sharp. Uh, but uh, I think it was Ernie Critchlow. Since Ernie, uh, I knew Ernie well, uh, going back to 1958. Oh, wow. And uh, so it was probably Ernie. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what space you showed in? Was it over at Joseph Papp's Theater? Where was your show? I can't remember. <laughs> I, it might have been, uh, uh, was it the Broadway and what, Spring Street? Location, I'm not too sure. Oh, you were on Soho then, in the Soho space, yeah. I I think so. Oh, good. Yeah, that was the latest space. That was their last uh, venue, in fact. And and, and I'll have to ask you, do you uh, recall if they, uh, they moved up to 72nd Street or somewhere? You know what, the... Otto, I showed in the 72nd Street space. Okay, because I remember after them that being space, away. they moved to Soho. Oh. On on Broadway, what you're talking about? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I was I actually showed in the '80s on the seventy in the seventy second Street space, yes, and then yes. they moved down to Broadway to Soho. Yes, I think I showed the, uh, you know, the Broadway space. Mm hmm That was a great space. Great location. Yes, yes, yes. Wonderful location. Yeah. What do you recall about the Cinque community and all the artists that were there and that showed there? What are some of the anecdotal stories that you recall? Like I said, my memory is horrible. I just, I can't remember too much mm -hmm. uh, about, uh, you know, who or what, mm -hmm. what the show was about. Uh, whether it was any um, flyers or brochures, I, I can't. I, I, in fact, I, I looked around to see if there was anything in my uh, stash of, about uh, the shows that I might have been in, and I couldn't find anything. Okay. And my, like I said, my memory is very, very poor. Did you know Romare Bearden? Yes, uh, I, I met him. We. Uh, uh, met at the Bob Blackburn Printmaking Workshop. He was working on some things, and I was working on some things at that time. Mm -hmm. And so it's it, that's it's going back quite a few, few years. Also, yeah. Uh, uh, Norm, in fact, uh, Norman Lewis also. Uh, I worked with him at uh, another location uh, of the Bob Blackburn Printmaking Workshop on uh, I think it was uh, West Seventeenth Street when yeah. I first met uh, Norman. Wonderful. That was an amazing space. That atelier brought so many artists together. It's yes, incredible, yes. the history of that space. Yeah. Yes. So right now I'm looking at this gorgeous piece called Mood 11. Tell us what is all going on. It looks like a collage. It's absolutely rich and beautiful. Well, uh, I have to say that my collages are much different from they're, they're unique because I don't use rarely use any magazines or uh, cutouts from uh, publications and so on. All of the materials that I use for these uh, collages are made up of collages, no collagraphs Collagraph. that I printed at the Bob uh, Printmaking Workshop. So all of the materials, textures, and so on, are original textures that came from uh, things that I created. Mm. Uh, in fact, it started out with 
me this, uh, uh, putting aside uh, uh, co- uh, calligraphs that didn't come out too well, you know? Mm-hmm. But I hated to throw away mm-hmm. the images. And they stayed around for years and years. And finally, I decided to start doing some collages. And that's how I came to use those materials. There's lace, there's string, there's buttons, there's keys, there's zippers, there's wood grain. All of those materials I created in the making of the uh, collagraphs at the Bob Blackburn uh, Blackburn Workshop. And the the process is a technique I learned from Krishna Reddy called viscosity printing, where multicolors are printed at one time on the press with one pass through the press. You can get a variety of colors, three, four, five, six, maybe up to about eight or ten, ten colors you can get with the, this process called viscosity printing. And the principle behind it is oily ink resists lesser oily ink. Where you uh, you take your, your plate, which uh, I might mention uh, you might put on a piece of uh, masonite or mat board. You would put some uh, zippers, keys, buttons, lace, burlap, uh, anything that's relatively flat. You can glue on and then coat it and treat it. So you glue it down. And then the process is you uh, ink up the, the plate with the uh, ink, then you wipe it off with a, um, a material called tarlatan, which is stiff cheesecloth. You wipe it off, and then with oily ink and a roller, you roll up uh, on a slab uh, another color with oily ink, linseed oil or another type of oil, perhaps. You roll it across the plate, and that deposits a layer, of, another layer of color. Then you go to another roller, which is a little softer, with another color with less oil. And you roll it with another color, and you roll it across the plate again. And that ink, the ink that's on there, will repel the new ink. And because the plate is has different levels because of the def- different textures and materials that you use, and you're using a soft roller, that color is placed in another level. And then you go to the next uh, uh, roller, which is softer yet. In fact, the the last roller, I think it's called a gelatin roller. It's very, very soft. And another color with uh, ink, uh, uh, very, very little ink uh, added, if, if uh, perhaps none at all. But then you roll across the plate again. And because this is a ro- a, a softer roller, it goes into the uh, deeper areas of the plate and deposits another layer of color. Now, sometimes there's a little bit of mixing because uh, the uh, oil uh, is not exactly right. But sometimes you can have happy, a happy accident. But by this time, you've deposited maybe three or four or five uh, uh, layers of colors on your plate. Mm. Then you lay your paper on top. Put the, put the plate on the on the press. Lay a paper which has been dampened. Lay it on top. Roll it, run it through, and then you get a variety of uh, uh, beautiful colors. So that's how my uh, calligraphs were made, and those calligraphs, the discarded ones, were taken and and uh, used to produce the the uh, piece that you're speaking about, Mood 11. And I might mention that Mood 11 was the uh, result of the pan- pandemic. I had a lot of time, you know, and I produced about 20 uh, collages during that time. And Mood 11 is about one of the last ones. So, is this the actual plate that you printed from, collaged? Well, or is the plate paper? is made up of, is like a, a mat board or, uh, or uh, 
masonite or whatever, whatever you can place the, that's relatively thin, that you can place these various materials on. Right, right. And and glue them down and then use that process that I spoke about, right. the scratch printing, to produce the various colors. Yeah, uh, and the color graph, of course, comes from the word collage because right, yes. you are bringing different elements together onto yes. that board. And right. then many times what you'll do too is you'll coat it maybe with gesso so that the paper doesn't tear or you do something... But uh, I love that process because I love the embossing that happens. Yeah, right. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's, it's just that, so that's rich. What makes, yes, that's what makes the, my collages different because it has texture from the various uh, materials. Like I said, like one of the things I use sometimes, taking a piece of uh, plywood, and you know sometimes plywood has these beautiful uh, grains and textures and so on. So I take a wire brush and start scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing and wearing away the softer parts of the the plywood, revealing these these uh, beautiful uh, grains, and and then applying that to the plate, and then using the viscosity technique on that. So you yeah. get the wood wood grain, the grain of with the wood. The, uh, with, uh, you know, various colors. You can really do some wonderful There's things so with that. so many things, yeah. It's wonderful. Yes. And now I'm looking at Rasta Woman, yes. which I think is another one of the collard graphs, yes? Right, yes. Yeah, that's one of my favorite pieces, too. And that, that goes back perhaps uh, when I first started. Uh, that's probably about, uh, about 20 years now, where in the... Uh, Moon Woman is uh, uh, recent, just just uh, last year, 2020. Okay. Boy, so these are the recent works. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah, not, not Rasta Woman. Rasta Woman, like, goes, like I said, goes, goes back. back to about oh, okay. Years. It's, the, it's the first one. Okay, Moody Levin. Ah, yes. I see. So now you're revisiting some of these techniques and ideas. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. And what about Journey... Into infinity. Oh, that that's uh, an acrylic piece, and that was done perhaps uh, twenty-five years ago or so. Okay. And uh, I might mention that uh, at one time uh, I used to practice yoga, and this uh, came about as a result of that. And uh, there's an interesting story <laughs> that I have to tell. I used to work nights. And I used to get home about two or three o'clock in the morning. And at that time, I used to, you know, strip down and in the middle of the floor in my living room, start practicing yoga and uh, going to the yoga exercises. And I would always end up with the headstand. Mm. And this particular morning, I had the most beautiful experience. You know, it was uh, I went into uh, another world. I, w I wasn't here. I, you know, I was somewhere else, but it was beautiful. Mm. But then I I wanted to c uh, come down from the headstand, and I found I couldn't. I tried to rock and uh, you know to fall and you know move, but I couldn't. I was rooted up there, oh my straight God. Uh, up and down. You know, upside down uh -huh. head in the middle of my living room. Oh my goodness. And then it went through my mind, oh, my wife is wake up in the morning and find me dead upside down. <laughs> oh my God. Was, but it but anyhow, I I kept, you know, trying I don't know how long I, I was uh in that position. But then I said, you know, to myself, relax, relax. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. I came back and my body became limp and I got down. Mm -hmm. but, that, but that was really, wow. and I might have to say that's the last time I did the head. It was in there. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Well, this one, it really does have the sense of a very peaceful moment, maybe even meditative. Um, yes. Yeah, the idea of uh, the sun coming through. I'm not sure if that's the sun or maybe a full moon even coming through the doorway, creating the shadow of this woman. Uh, who's looking directly at us. Yeah, and you said this is all acrylic? That's acrylic, yes. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Okay, I wanted to move on now to uh, discovery. Now, discovery is a, a bronze sculpture that I did uh, and that's now in the, um, the Brooklyn Children's Center. This is a state-run facility in Brooklyn that is for young people. It's about a, a two-block, two-square-block uh, uh, facility where uh, you know, young people have, you know, have had problems, you know, uh, uh, they are housed there. So this is in the yard there. Now, the image that you might see uh, uh, is uh, before they decide to landscape the area around it. So it, you know, it doesn't have all of the, the the bushes and uh, uh, weeds and whatnot around it. It's a uh, in a much better looking setting. Mm -hmm. But it's the Brooklyn Children's Center, and it's in uh, in uh, Brook. Uh, I guess Bedford Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn. Is that where that is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's at yeah. Bedford uh, Brooklyn uh, and Bergen Street, eighteen forty five uh, Bergen Street mm -hmm. is the entrance, and, and that's at uh, Ralph Avenue, the entrance. Where were you doing your bronze work? Who was what foundry? Where were you? Do you recall? Well, I, I, I I've used uh, quite a few foundries, but the the one uh, that I used lately is Beatty Mackey. But uh, I, I've used uh, uh, maybe about four or five different foundries over the years. But Beatty Mackey is the one that did the one. piece that I have at Prospect Park, and mm -hmm. uh, and the. And the for the last uh, 20 some odd years, I've been using the Beanie Monkey. Wonderful. Wow. I'm now looking at Afro Strut, which I love. Absolutely stunning. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. Talk about this piece. Well, you know, I, I like the, the, the form of uh, African American women, well, black women. Uh, and uh, this is just an image that popped in my head, and I I just felt I had to, you know, create something, you know, celebrating the wonderful shape <laughs> of uh, black women. Yes, and she's standing quite erect, and she's making no, that she's, move. She's, she's, she's walking she's, forward. She's strutting. She's strutting. <laughs> she's truly strutting. She's walking forward, secure in herself, of uh, the beautiful body. Wonderful. So where do you do your sculpture? Are you drawing first? How do you start your sculpture pieces? Well, you know, uh, most most of the time I, uh, on a scrap of paper or maybe a little pad, I may make some uh, uh, sketches. In fact, there's a, a whole lot of scraps of paper with uh, images uh, that I've uh, created. You know, they're floating all, all over. I mean, some of them I really like. Um, but uh, the idea starts out maybe uh, on a scrap of paper sometimes, you know, and back of an envelope bronze, or whatever. Uh, with the bronze pieces, then you work with clay, is that it? Yes, well, and you know, clay you or uh, plastiline. Okay, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Non-drying clay, you know, the plastiline. Right. That's what mm -hmm. I generally work. Oh, good. Since the okay. regular clay is a little bit messy. Now, another stunning piece, and I love the photo of this, is Young General Moses. This is the piece that will be in Creative Community, Stinke Gallery Artists in May. This is stunning. Oh, yes. Tell Young us General about Moses. your influence on this one. What were your ideas for this General Moses, Young General Moses? Well, uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, she was known as Young General Moses. And uh, she's one of my favorite, you know, heroes. And uh, I mean, I'm fascinated by uh, the the life she's led. You know, the story that that's come out about her uh, wonderful deeds. You know, during that time. And I felt I had to, uh, you know, pay tribute in the form of uh, a piece of work, artwork, sculpture. You know, I, I'm looking at and, this wood too, uh, Otto, and the way that you have allowed us to see kind of the, the real wood piece below, the kind of roughness, uh, but also the strength of the wood. And then the way that all of a sudden her skin, this very soft quality comes about, 
there's something that really relates. I, I can imagine her walking through the woods with her people that she's trying to free, trying to get them up north to Canada. Something mm. about trees come to mind. Uh, this natural uh, force that I'm sure she was hiding around and working with and understood how to move about. And so I think this idea of working with the tree form, with the natural wood, is just so appropriate for her. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, the, the the piece, uh, the wood, actually was found about a block away, a block or so away from uh, my house on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. I saw it and I said, well, this looks like a beautiful piece of wood. I got to do something with it. I took it home, put it into my garage, mm -hmm. and then finally Harriet Tubman came to mind and I dragged it out and started shipping. And that's, uh, that's what you see. Beautiful. You know, what I don't know if people understand, uh, certainly a lot of the students, the Art Students League know this, but you're working with the additive and subtractive. With clay, you're adding, but with wood and stone, you're subtracting. And you master both of these. Um, just incredible. This is a, it's a stunning piece. I'm looking forward to seeing this in the show. Sorry. I'm so happy to put the piece in so others can see it. Yeah, it's going to be fine. I'm looking now at the piece you did on of, of Ernie, your good friend Ernie Critchlow, who again was one of the founders of St. Kate Gallery. And he's smiling and he's looking very happy and he has one of his seminal pieces hanging behind him. Do we all remember that beautiful print that he did uh, of this young woman sitting on her front porch? Tell us a little bit about Ernie and this piece that you've done. Well, uh, the piece, I, I uh, chose a photograph that it had of uh, Ernie and I placed him in front of uh, that uh, beautiful work of his, which I own. I bought one of his pieces. That uh, That's one of the pieces I bought of his. Mm -hmm. So I placed it, uh, him in front of that and I did a watercolor. And, and uh, sadly, uh, you know, he passed a few years ago uh, th this was, uh, I think I did the piece and I, I think it's uh, 2001. He was still alive. He was still with us during those days. And the the piece was reacquired from him uh, recently. Ah. I mean, from from his estate. Okay. Because the, the, the house was damaged and uh, they were getting rid of uh, the materials there. And uh, so the piece was returned to me. You know, I was glad to have it back, but uh, mm -hmm. sorry to lose Ernie. Yeah. Because he was a wonderful person. Like I said, I met, met him uh, back in 1958, mm -hmm. along with uh, Jacob Lawrence, uh, when they uh, were co-founders of the Fulton Art Fair in Brooklyn. Oh. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. in fact, I mentioned, mentioned that... Uh, Besides Ernie Critchlow and Jacob Lawrence, Richard Mayhew was a part of the fair. Mm. Uh, 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 Vincent Smith. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, Al Hollingsworth. Oh, my goodness. They all yeah. started back there in 1958, you know. And like I said, wow. uh, Ernie was the uh, co director of the Fulton Art Fair along with Jacob Lawrence uh, during that time. Ernie was amazing. He was always helping other artists. He was very giving of his knowledge. And uh, yeah, we all appreciate what he has done for us and Cinque Gallery. You know, I, have oh, a, yes. I have a quote here that says, you say that uh, your talent comes directly from your ancestors. Can you speak That's to that? That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes, because... Uh, I can't place uh, any family member, any close family member, with uh, you know being able to uh, draw and paint. Although I might mention this, that all my life I had thought that this cousin of mine, David Nils, with whom I used to, uh, who used to care for me when my parents were in the fields working, 
and who uh, uh, I, I when we came to New York, I was to stay with his parents uh, during those early years. Now, from from my uh, coming to New York, I was about four or five, and uh, so there was you know uh, contact with him during those early years. And in my mind, I pictured him drawing and me watching him draw and trying to emulate the things that he was doing, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But later on, in fact, I was an adult. This is going back about 20 years ago, so 25 years. Um, I took this book. Um, uh, he uh, He had retired, went back to the South to live. And I went down to see him, and I presented him with this book, a book that uh, written by Elton Sachs called Black Artists of the New Generation, Elton in which uh, there's a part about me in there. And it mentioned that uh, David uh, uh, Niels was, was the influence to be, you know, behind my ability to uh, draw. And I showed him the book. I said, look, there's a part in here about you. And he looked at it and he says, what are you talking about? I never drew. So what I believe, I believe that when I was young, I probably had a dream that he was drawing, and that I was watching him draw, and I, you know, was you know trying to you know copy the things that he was drawing, and he never drew. So I believe it was probably some sort of mis- something mystical, something, you know, like I said, a dream or you know, some other mystery. What a wonderful story! I love it. I said, you are a storyteller in the flesh and also with your art. Thank you so much, Otto Niels. This is wonderful. What a blessing to have you and to hear you speak about your work. Thank you so much. And uh, we will see you in May at the show. Okay, I thank you. I'm, I'm so glad to be a part of it. Thank you so much. 